now, only on KGRA Radio, this is the Starborn Connection. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to another edition of the Starborn Connection radio show. We're here every Saturday night from 10 to midnight. Most of the time we're live. Every once in a while, we have to take a break. Anyway, we have a really special guest for you tonight, and uh, I just want to ask our producer, Bill, how are you, buddy? Doing really great, and how are you and Julia doing tonight? Well, I'm doing great. Julia, how are you? I'm rocking. Absolutely (laughs) rocking. (laughs) Well, listen, you you know, usually I have something from uh, the Podraska sisters, uh, but this week I have been so busy with, uh, you know, I'm finishing this chapter, uh, and my dog had an operation, and we're trying. We have wow. to keep her, you know, all that blah blah stuff. Anyway, uh, I really I want to try and sell this book just for a second. Uh, Free, which is the foundation for research into extraterrestrial and extraordinary experiences, um, is publishing a book. Listen, people, free of charge on the website. Beyond UFOs, the science of contact with non-human intelligences. It's written by world-renowned physicists and behaviorists and, you know, you just name it. All of the science has a hand in this because we're coming up with some data that will blow you away, literally, about contact. Um, My particular chapter (laughs) is called... You're one of the experts. (laughs) <laughs> oh, I'm not. Oh, no, not in this area. But, uh, ecological and associated human behavioral messages from non-human intelligent beings for humanity, reported by contact experiencers. A primary examination of the free data. My God, my chapter introduction is longer than the book. Um, but uh, yeah, uh, the book is going to be free. Uh, hopefully, it'll be out sometime around August, September. Uh, but I, it's going to come out in two volumes, people. So that's lots of pages, lots of info, lots of data if you're interested. Okay. Now, Julie, wait, Michael, uh, before you begin with uh, introductions and everything, I just want both of you to know, you and Julia, that as your producer, last week we did have some type of electrical, it sounded like an electrical interference between, in the first hour, between the 57, I think it was. It could have been the 47 and the 48. It might have been the okay. 47 and 48, but I, I am telling you, I thought I heard a voice. Okay. Okay. Uh, Very I, good. I, um, because uh, I, I can give you a little bit of information here. Um, the commander said that uh, – no, actually, this is an interpretation from another, uh, another researcher – uh, it seems like everybody's jumping on the train. Uh, <laughs> a lot of people, a lot of people around the world. Uh, anyway, uh, I'm uh, I'm too impatient, uh, and uh, I should sit back and uh, relax and not worry about contact. Well, I, I'm not impatient. I have been waiting all my life for <laughs> contact. But um, you know. I think it's good. I think it's good because um, I'm pretty sure that they tried last week. The problem was uh, – the problem is is that the frequency that they uh, uh, project on is so low that audibly only insects can hear it. It's really like in well, – you know, wasn't, the- it, wasn't it that eh? Yes. That eh? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. There could have, yeah, that could have. I heard an eh, like a – yeah. Yeah. yeah, because, you know, the atmosphere and then the equipment and everything can, uh, you know, mess up actually the signal whereby we can get it. But if, if we had an electrical thing happen on uh, the on the uh, tape or on the tape, geez, you can tell I was born in 1956, uh, on the file, then, you know, let's count it as a possible contact. 
I would advise people to go to the archives, listen for themselves. You can go to the KGRA archives, uh, dot com and go to the show from last week, Starborn Connection, and listen for yourselves. I heard it between, I think it was the 47 and the 48, uh, okay. Michael and, and Julia. Laura Eisenhower was the guest. Yes. So yeah. Just yes. Know. That's right. Now, okay. there is a possibility. There is a possibility we'll get another interruption tonight. Oh, um, yeah. <laughs> Because um, I, I just think that uh, they're going to try again because of uh, the fact that we supposedly didn't hear it last week. I don't want to be considered impatient. So if it happens, <laughs> there you go. Okay. You All know, right, Ollie. Way I'm going to go. sit back, and uh, they said that I used to love to smoke a pipe, so I'll sit back with my pipe. This is what the aliens said, you know. Oh my uh, God. Oli, right? Said I, I used to like to smoke a pipe. All right, anyway, uh, that's enough. Julia, it's yours. It's yours, my dear. Hi, everybody. Well, I have a marvelous guest tonight. Um, She's definitely a Facebook friend and experiencer, speak friend. So her name is Valenia, and she lives in a remote spot in Oregon where she had many paranormal experiences. She had a booth at the Experience or Speak conference in 2014 in Maine, and both Mike and I were at that conference as well. It was a great conference. Uh, There, she finally was able to connect with others like her, both contactees and experiencers alike. She has traveled in Europe. She's also studying ancient Sumerian to better research our history. She and her partner have a jewelry business. Her jewelry has symbols similar to crop circles. And she can match the perfect piece to the right customer. She has had many psychic experiences. She also has many UFO uh, sightings and sightings of cryptoids, which are the unusual animals. For many years, she has had uh, she has had a booth at the Renaissance Fair, and during her course there, she heard many customers share their interesting stories of the paranormal. So she decided to write a book encompassing all these great stories as well as her own. And her book is called Reflections from a Crop Circle Case. It further states true stories of UFOs, Bigfoot, crop circles, ghosts, floating tree stumps, giant salamanders, and more. I read the book. It is fascinating easy read with short chapters she gets right to the point of the stories and it was definitely a fascinating read and i'm going to ask her some questions and then actually the last hour uh Lenia and i are kindred spirits we're all about the ascension process and the and the um uplifting of mankind into new consciousness and a new society a new earth paradigm so we're going to discuss uh, all that information. And then I also have two news stories, two things that are going on, which kind of prove that ascension uh, that ascension is actually kind of working. It's kind of working. So, Valenia, how are you? And is there anything you can add to your bio that I missed? Oh, thank you, Julia and Michael. That was a great lead-in. I really appreciate that. And giving me a chance to share these stories, and I'm really looking forward to that. It's going to be nice to be able to to put in a couple stories that I wasn't able to get into the book. There was a few that I thought most casual readers might have a difficult time with, and obviously KGRA listeners are not them. So I'm looking forward to sharing that as well. I'm really interested in the fact that you're that this is a, a major point in focus with you folks is the contact because this is something that I'm really interested in and I've been trying to figure out myself is that it seems through many ways that they're trying to contact us but they aren't the way that humans do it and we're having to kind of learn their way but it seems like it's our responsibility to be working at this end right now and um so a lot of my study kind of gets into that. But if I was getting to the booth here, it was a perfect place to collect stories at the Renaissance Fair. People there, there's kind of a relaxed, judgmental energy. You're under the trees, you know. Sometimes there's deer that wander through in the morning. And people feel relaxed, and they just feel comfortable. 
So what I used to do is I, I had fun with my crop circle jewelry, and I used to ask somebody if I saw them looking at them, what was the strangest thing that ever happened to them? It's perfect, perfect question because everybody had a story. What's funny is that sometimes you could tell they'd never even told their family because they'd wait till they left the booth or they'd leave with them and then they'd kind of sneak back again really fast. And you could tell they were really relieved when they told them. So I, I get a feeling probably everybody has had something happen to them. They're just not talking. Of course, then I got started on that and then um, I couldn't help but start talking on the Yurok reservation was at where I was living at the point in time because it was um it's really close to the area where they had the bigfoot um the patterson video in fact that's only about two miles from our house i've never actually seen the bigfoot but i've been at one point when i was way back in the back country that i had a really strong feeling that was just saying you are not welcome here and i left wow and i had a real strong feeling what it was and i came back next week and there was nothing Hmm. I'd, I'd heard of this happening, and I'd actually talked to a lady at the local Bigfoot Museum that was saying, yeah, that's about regular. That's probably what it was. Well, that's that's really interesting because um, I forget what year. I think it was two years ago at the Experiencers Speak conference. We uh, were witness to... Um, we had branches of trees. It was way. It was out in Maine, in in the wilderness. Uh, we had branches of trees moving. Uh, we had uh, rock, little rocks being thrown at us, uh, and and a couple of other behavioral things like that. But there was no one there, and we were wondering if uh, you know it, it. We thought maybe it was Bigfoot. Uh, we weren't really sure because when we when we turned around, there was no one there. Uh, is it possible that they can just disappear? I would think that they can. And, you know, I have, there's one story in my book that's always puzzled me because it really kind of got into that. Um, a fellow, a friend of ours, again, you know, like a lot of folks that see Bigfoot, they also see UFOs, et cetera. This is a Native American man lived in Hupa. And his story was basically it was winter and he felt like going for a drive up in the mountains in the snow and he headed out. And at a certain point when he was way up on the ridge through the snow, he decided to take a little walk and stretch his legs. And it had been snowing really hard. It had snowed a couple of times and he had several crusts. And so he's walking along and he's going through the crusts. But he, he went a little further and he saw the tracks going right across the road. Wow, wow. And the thing that, is, that got him was that he was saying, you know, he could tell by the weight because it went way down, went way past where he would have. So he knew mm. it had to be way heavier than him. But it started at one side of the road and it just disappeared on the other. Wow, wow. Wow. And something yeah. that large, you could see there was snow under the canopy. There should have been tracks there. His, his suggestion was, of course, that he was thinking, well, it's an ape. Maybe they climb into the trees. There's some, you know, there's the old growth there. But I'm looking at those trees, and they would not support something of that size. Yeah. Not that old. You think it disappeared into I, another dimension? or? I tend to think so. I've read so many times where people would say fire at one of these things, and they just disappear. Mm. And yet they're making marks. I mean, you can tell they're dimensional while they're here. Well, that Julia, we were we were uh, mentioning about Bigfoot uh, at the experiences. Remember when the tree branches were bending and, and oh yeah, we were getting, there. Yeah, yeah, pelted with little pebbles yeah, and I've stuff. I've heard about that. Yeah, wow. I've heard about that too. That was the first time I've ever heard of something like that. <laughs> yeah, playful, I guess. They might have been juveniles. Yeah. Yeah, and there's a possibility, too. You hear of all the different sizes of them, and you kind of wonder if maybe that's the reason for some of the little ones, that they're just not grown-ups. Now, did you have any experiences uh, where you live now with Bigfoot? No, you know, but we're, we've been thinking about going to an area i just been here reading um back in the end of the 1900s there was apparently a an account of a giant wild man at one of these 
one of these mines locally, and we've actually been thinking of putting up a game cam. I was listening on one of the podcasts where they were talking about luring them in with baked goods. They say they really like the white flour and sugary stuff, which kind of <laughs> cracked me up. <laughs> but they said they love that stuff. And I was thinking, well, that would be interesting. Maybe you should just put up a cam and see. Apparently, there were miners that were tossed off this, this mine, like about three of them that died, and the last one was alive. And he mentioned this giant hairy man, he said, with long, grisly, yellowish hair that had grabbed him and tossed him off the side. And this is before people were making Bigfoot sightings. Wow. He just called him a hairy wild man. He didn't know what else to call him. I think the natives here called them devils. <laughs> oh, because there's a lot of areas that are called the, this devil and that devil. And in the Yurok Reservation, which I, where we used to live, they used to call um, a lot of these entities devils, too. Well, there's a lot of different oh, types of Bigfoot um, from yeah, a, lo a lot of people. Yeah, a lot of people that I'm connected with actually find them very positive and high spiritually. Um, they're actually, mm -hmm. they teach us. So there might be different types. Uh, well, they can also be very protective of an area and they can also mm -hmm. get nasty when they're, when they see a gun or when they're being threatened. And of course, if I was a minor and I saw something like that, I might want to take my gun and shoot it. I'd be afraid. I'm sure but, that'd be the first thing that, knowing minors, I would imagine <laughs> that'd be the first thing they'd think of, actually. Yeah. I, there sounds like there's at least three different kinds, you know, from talking around on the reservation. And then also there's a book um, to the American Indian by Chinawa Wichawa. I think Lucy Thompson is her name. And she gets into the various kinds, too. There's a giant one that lives on the mountain, on the very top they call Rich Walkers. And those guys are nasty, and they are cannibals, and those you don't want to meet. And they sounded like these are the yellowy-haired, grizzly ones. And then there's the ones that are kind of in the middle area, and you'd meet them occasionally hunting. And they were pretty reasonable. Uh, a waitress in the local cafe actually said, these are, these are the forest protectors. You don't have to worry about them. You know, if you meet them really fast, you might want to back up or or give them a fish if you have one or something, but they're not going to attack you. She said the ones that are really dangerous are the little foot. Mm. And those little guys, yeah, they, they look like maybe a 10-year-old child, but they're covered with fur, and they like to get people's attention, and they like to get them thinking that they can maybe catch them, and then they lead them right into the middle of the woods and sneak oh. off. Oh. <laughs> And I was talking to a lady, a Native American lady um, from the, who is it, um, the Canadian, one of the reserves, around in the Great Lakes area, and she was telling me that they have exactly the same kinds, those three kinds, which got me thinking. I mean, that's almost half, it's more than halfway across the United States. <laughs> yeah. So I'm, I doubt they were talking with the folks, you know, in our backyard. Oh, well. <laughs> now... There are some other uh, unusual animals. Can, can you tell us about the salamanders you saw? Yeah, I don't know whether I call them George or the Poof Poof. I guess I never knew about them to begin with, and apparently they were named. Um, well, the one that I saw, it, you know, you hardly call it a giant because, you know, it, it's not huge. It's not Godzilla size, like right. we think of giants, but... But for what it was, it was huge, and it had me totally baffled. Was it like was, a foot I or was, three feet in, in length? It was three feet long. It was three feet long, and it was on land. Now, I know there's, there's water-going salamanders of that size, but the biggest one in America that's land-going is about a foot. And we, do have, we did have them on the reservation. Everybody knew what they looked like. Nobody would mistake them for that. But I, I found this thing out camping in the middle of the night. It just kind of went through my camp, just kind of heading down to the creek. And I heard it crunching. And there was a lot of leaves, so you couldn't really tell how big it was. So I flopped out of my, you know, my hammock and took a look at it. And I just went, that's a damn dinosaur. 
I mean, I couldn't even relate to what it could be at first because there was nothing, I had no frame for it. And then I realized, well, generally it's, it's soft, it looks soft skinned and it resembled a, a lizard or a, you know, an amphibian of some kind. And then I realized what it was was an extremely large salamander that was extremely flat, um, kind of like a, a rattler is to a regular snake, you know, very wide-bodied and flat. So you wouldn't immediately think salamander because they're kind of little and, and cute, you know. And it had deeply inset eyes instead of the bulgy eyes like salamanders have. And it just it just kind of threw me. I didn't really know what to do about it. I thought about trying to take it home because I knew nobody's ever going to believe me on this thing. But I knew I had to jump a creek, and I knew there was also no way I could be holding this thing while I did it. So I just let him go, and I thought about it for a few years. And then I found this book that was one of these hand-published things, you know, and it was all about the the local legends and, the, and it was all about Bigfoot mostly, but the very last chapter, it called the monster of the Siskiyous, which this wasn't, we weren't in there, but we were very close. And it described this critter totally. And it described him as one of the, one of the crypto critters that was known to native Americans and they called it a poof poof. And they actually had legends about it. And I've never heard about this or seen anything like this in any natural history book. So later on, you know, I started asking people. Once I saw that, I got thinking, well, maybe I'll ask around. And I found out that almost all of our local neighbors had seen them at least once. And then I, I, was, I happened to be, this to make you wonder how rare this thing really is, because I was at my dentist's. And I'm just kind of growling that I've seen this thing, and I can't tell anyone. He gets real quiet, and he says, Polinia, I saw a giant salamander. And he was living out on the coast, way far from the reservation, but he was crawling under his, underneath his house trying to install a cable. And this thing came around the side, one of the girders underneath there. And he thought, the first thing he thought was, was it was a Komodo dragon. He, again, his reality just started wobbling when he saw this thing and he started backing up as fast as he could. And he didn't really know what to think about it. But later, years later, he talked to the guy that sold him the house. And just off the cuff, he suddenly remembered. And he said, do you know there's a giant salamander under that house? And the guy just laughed. He said, ah, he met George. <laughs> and, of course, that really threw him. You know, he met, he's got George, a name. The George, yeah, he had named it. And Greg was really wondering, does he have a relationship? Does he give it to scraps after dinner? You know, but apparently he'd never told anyone either. I think, you know, it's almost, almost normal. I mean, if you didn't know anything about natural science, you might think, well, possibly there might be giant salamanders out there. But they're not in any books, and I've been looking for years. I never heard of a giant salamander. You know, to me, the closest thing would just be like an iguana lizard, which, you know, it's nothing to it's not, you know. <laughs> so yeah. yeah, yeah. But the oddest thing of that, though, is it's just right around the corner in the in Trinity County. Supposedly, from the 1900s, they do have legends of giant salamanders, and they sound nothing like George. Mm. These are water-going ones, and they're up to ten feet long. Really? Wow! wow. Yeah, and That's the more that I've read about them. They sounded like hellbenders or those giant Asian salamanders, which mm. really got me wondering because, you know, the, they've only, the last um, reports were in the early 1900s, except for one that I got actually off of a friend of mine who was a pawn shop owner. And he was telling me about a friend of his that went fishing got his lure caught under the bank on the opposite side, and there was a monster salamander underwater that, you know, had eaten it, essentially, and he just decided to cut his line. But this one sounded like the ones they were talking about, and you can, I checked all the different spots where they'd um, seen them, and you can tell it had a territory that seems right up next to George's, but not overlapping. 
So I bet you there's a lot of creatures that we don't know that are out there. I mean, there's a lot of woods, a lot of forests, um, even deep in the ocean. I'm sure there's there's some. Are there any other creatures that come to mind that are unusual that you've heard about? Well, you know, I was mentioning the devils. Now, the Indians have their own Native Americans. Well, they call themselves both. But there's um, there's also um, a Kamas, which is a river monster and supposedly has a, um, a house of stone at the very bottom of the, of the river, which is one reason that you want to be really careful swimming across because they like to capture people, haul them down to their house, and they drown. The Indian devils interested me a lot. Supposedly, they come in in the mist, and the only way that you can tell that they're there is by the red eyes that you can see through the mist. And they like to kidnap women and children. Oh, wonderful. You can see kind of an wow. overlap here, you know. I'm saying, I heard that, but they weren't called devils. <laughs> uh. I guess how you, it's how you interpret them, pretty much. Wow. So... So you also went down to Mexico, and I think that was the first time you saw a UFO, if I'm not correct. And could it you was, tell us yeah. a little about that? Yeah, it was interesting. Actually, you know, I went down twice. The first time I saw one, and the second time I went down and brought Terry so he could see him too. And he saw one and I didn't, which kind of irritated me because I did all the work. But the first time I was invited down, by um, one of Colin Andrews' um, research teams. I'd been kind of working with him for some years. And and um, it was one of those situations where you're going, oh, I don't have the money, how can I do it? And then suddenly something happens, and then you do. And then you know you're supposed to go. Oh, and yes. so I did. <laughs> yeah, and so the first night was that we were out on on the top of the hotel watching for UFOs. And we had a um, we had a tape going, so we were, we were playing the sounds of UFOs, seeing if we could get their attention. And it didn't seem to make much difference. And then we flipped it over to the one that said crop circles. Now this is where it gets kind of weird, because I'm waiting for a, I was waiting on the UFO because I had heard something over my house years before, not that long actually, and that that sounded like a giant road grater. It woke me up immediately, and it was the first time that I noticed skin excisions on my back. I didn't even notice that till it was gone because it was just it was overwhelming, and then I was aware that my back hurt. But yeah, it sounded like a road grader with two different sounds, you know. And um, that's what I heard on the crop circle tape. And this kind of threw me because I went, "This is not a crop circle." I asked Colin and Cynthia about it later, and they said they'd slow down trilling of a crop circle because that they had been getting in there because they had found that it seemed to change people's brain waves or something or their brain patterns. And so they just kind of left it there to see what reaction, I guess, that they would get. And up till then, I had just assumed that that sound was something from a machine But I listened to that and I said, well, maybe it was actually a means to an end and was being projected, which I would not never have thought. I was listening to it, and then I remembered thinking, because I could hear it moving away, and I was thinking, oh, come back. I I need to get you in my memory, and then it did. And then it hung for, and then it headed out again. So I'm listening on the top of the deck, you know, on the, on the roof of this motel, and I'm kind of boggled about that. And then they bring out the night vision scopes, which I had never seen before. and I was immediately addicted to. And we were watching things flickering around in the sky. And I wasn't really sure about them because I, I could think of other things they might be. But the next night, there was a conference. Um, it was Colin and um, Jaime Lassan and a number of other folks were getting together in the motel. And I happened to be with the night vision scope looking out the window and I could see something that looked like a donut flying in the sky and it had the middle of it was darker than the sky around it and it was doing these arcs and jerks around and I was kind of shocked because supposedly there is a a local UFO which is called a donut 
And this sounded exactly like it. And after a bit, it jumped out of view, but I could see a couple that looked like they were just sitting there. And I asked one of the guys walking by, and I told them what I was seeing, and they said, oh, it's just night visions. You know, you're not used to them. And I thought, well, maybe that's what it is. But I gave it over to a lady that was next to me that was from the town and just to see what she'd think. And she started looking out the window, and suddenly she's following it, zipping around, and her eyes were getting wide. And after a moment, she gives it back to me, you know, and I say, hey, you know, I don't know Spanish, but I knew that meant what. And she says, donut. (laughs) So she's been watching it also. (laughs) And that was the first UFO. I had heard him. I had had a sounding, I should call, years before, but I'd never seen one until then. I didn't think I was the kind of person that saw UFOs. You know how you get an idea like that. Well, that changed because from the book, yeah. it looks like you saw a lot of them in your property. Yeah, afterwards. You know, when I was on that trip, I was introduced to the work of um, T.R. Dutton. And there's a fellow that used to be with British Aerospace who took early retirement to study UFOs. He was interested in the propulsion, but what he actually discovered was track lines. And he found that there seemed to be some kind of a sling effect where they would hit a certain point on the equator, and then depending on how the Earth was shifting, you could predict basically where you would see them if you were to see them during that night. And I, when I went home, I, I went back through all my journals, and I found the date of my sounding. And I got in contact with him, and he sent me a graph from my area. And it was overlapped. It was like we were in like the center of a spider web. There was so many of crossing right over our house. And there was, there was the sounding right there. And what was strange was that the year before, something had happened also, a contact. And according to his, um, his work, that's exactly what you would expect. I've, I've had other people tell me about sightings that they've had exactly a year apart because, as he said, they repeat yearly. Once you know what your graph is, essentially, you can just go out there and wait for them. So I, used to, I got myself a Russian third-generation night vision, and I just sat out there at night and watched. And after that, I started to see other strange things. I've seen, there's other things up there too. Apparently in the very back country, there's an area that locally is supposedly like the, um, kind of like the Sipapu is for the Hopi. It's like the, the center of the world kind of, it's a sacred place. And there's places where like I was saying, you know, Bigfoot's only the, the Bigfoot, I forget what the name of the place is where they found it, but it's just a couple but the Lakes region is where they saw it on the Patterson video, and that's only a couple of miles away. And you used to see strange lights um, that would just suddenly flash on the mountains, and I could never understand. I could never get anyone to explain those either. But you just watch them flashing across the mountain one after the other. So yeah. it, was a, it was a strange place. Yeah, I know on Mount Adams... Yeah. You can see a lot of lights flashing, and they're usually ships coming out of the mountain. But they could also be, Mm -hmm. I think, on an Indian um, sacred ground, they could be spirits. They could be ancestors, all kinds of uh, spirits coming through. But didn't you have the feeling when you first see a UFO, there is sort of a contact going on or telepathy, and then... Then all of a sudden, like I know with MUFON when I do investigations, people will see a UFO Mm -hmm. for the very first time. And then all of a sudden, they start having more and more sightings uh, where the UFO is staying longer and there might be some sort of communication. Yeah, and you wonder which started which or did they just come together? Because I've noticed that a lot too. I've noticed, in fact, when I really started wanting to, to know more about them and to more experiences, I realized that there were certain people, they seemed to hang around. And if you hung around those people very long, you were going to start seeing things too. And I Absolutely. started doing that on purpose. Yeah. It now, my, 
Now, Mike has a question for you. Yeah, yeah, I do have a question. When I was younger, uh, my grandmother, who was born in Ireland and grew up, uh, she was born in like uh, 1895 or something like that. Uh, she would tell us stories about the little people, and she would swear that they were true. And, you know, I, when I was that age, I believed her but i'm wondering have you have you ever witnessed uh the little people leprechauns or or uh, fairies that's funny you'd mention leprechauns i've not i haven't seen them myself but our neighbor um in the last place that we lived in oregon did see a leprechaun in her barn huh. in traditional clothes the whole bit you know, she just saw him there. She's a very sensitive person. So I don't know if I had been mm. there, if I would have seen him or not. But she's open um, to a lot of interesting stuff that I've never heard anyone else talk about. I've they seen a fairy. I've... Oh, yeah? Yeah, I saw what a fairy like? um, at East City. Well, they, they can take different forms, like your typical, where they kind of look like Tinkerbell, but they're not quite like that there what i saw it had huge white wings it was about the size of my hand i don't have a very large hand um it's kind of small so i have like uh they had like white wings that didn't seem to have feathers it was kind of like a butterfly it was like one kind of you know there weren't feathers it was straight and with mm -hmm. no seams and the middle part however was plasma uh, I could make out Ooh. a little bit of a black body, but you could tell it was in between dimensions. And my girlfriend, uh, my friend <clears throat> at the time, she's very psychic and she has a fairy garden in her house. She lives in Olympia, Washington. So I stayed with her for a little bit before um, I went back home to Philadelphia. And she told me she actually saw a whole fairy, like the face, the body, and everything. And it was really adorable. It was like elfin looking, very tiny. And I did see, I saw a very small circular, like a very small orb. It was bright gold, and it came in from an open window. And it was the day I was leaving, and it came in, and it just stopped, like right in front of me. And it couldn't have been from the sun because the sun wasn't on that side, like like the dust you see from the sun. But it, it just stayed there. Mm -hmm. And then it popped, like it popped, you know, disappeared. So I knew it was saying goodbye. So, so yeah, they're definitely uh, there. Um, you said a ranch have, has tons of them. And elvins, elfin beans, which are tall with the elongated ears, very much like uh, the hobbit. You know all the different characters. So, huh. yeah. Do you think they're uh, ultra dim other dimensional? Do oh yeah, that's where they're, they live. Yeah, mm -hmm. they're definitely fourth, fifth, and sixth. Um, I think the fairies are fourth, fourth or fifth. Uh, <clears throat> but of course, there are a lot of like the Pleiadians. There are different groups of space are space brothers and sisters that are in different dimensions. So that's mm -hmm. why the contact may be a little rough because they have to go down the dimensions in order for, and it's painful for them to do that, uh, for mm -hmm. you to hear mm -hmm. them. So, so they do like to come to you mostly, or at least to me, in dreams. Uh, I did receive telepathy telepathy from a ship at East City. I told this story so many times <laughs> on the radio show. I had a big, huge craft come to me at East City, and there was telepathy. Oh. You know, just go to sleep. We're, you know, it was cold outside. Um, this is the last thing we're doing tonight because people do night watches all the time. So mm -hmm. there is a – I definitely feel there's a consciousness to contact, and it is about the upliftment of mankind. Because they do want contact, but we have to be a peaceful race in order for that to happen. And that's where we're headed. Mm -hmm. Feel the same way? Yeah, definitely. I feel like we're going that way, too. It, it, so much learning not to be passive about it. 
you know. I don't think that up till now um, they've tried to make contact with us. And I think, you know, they must get so confused because, you know, we'll wave our arms and jump up and down, and then they come down and we run. Well, I think they understand. (laughs) Yeah, I think the higher-minded ones, the spiritual ones, really understand. Mm -hmm. Um, That's why sometimes it takes a while till you can actually see them, you know, or or sometimes you never Mm -hmm. do. You just have have the contact. Um, So... So I wanted to ask you, what is a crop circle case? And is it a person, a hybrid, or? <laughs> well, what it was basically, uh, I was kind of making a joke. There's the crop circle case that I had at fair that was full of crop circle jewelry. And then you had the crop circle case that was standing right behind it that was selling the jewelry. <laughs> <laughs> and the reflections, of course, coming from both of them in, in different ways. I once I started getting into crop circles, it was like I just couldn't put them down. So I started. I think of that guy in um, Encounters of the Third Kind, where he's in his mashed potatoes. You oh know, yeah. He's starting to scrape in the damage. Well, I I couldn't do anything else. So I was making jewelry, and I kept thinking, if I can just, if I can do enough of them, maybe this language will make sense to me. You know, and it never really worked that way, but but it ended up. Um, bringing an awful lot of people at fair that seem to automatically relate to one crop circle design or another. And a lot of times I could tell just Mm. looking at them, which one it was. I mean, I was, I was giving them their crop circle and I, I gave a lot of discounts just to make sure that people (laughs) got the right ones if they didn't have enough money together, because you could tell. A lot of times they just pick on one. It was their crop circle, and I could see it in their eyes. I wouldn't even ask. I'd just pick it out of out of the case and give it to them. I was impressed with that. Yeah, yeah that, that's amazing. <laughs> now well, you it, it just yeah. happened. It just, just happened. happened, and you know, I was selling jewelry, and um, well, of course, there's a story in in the book there about when somebody started playing it back to me and, and shocked hell out of me (laughs) because I didn't realize they knew what I was doing and they were better at it than I was. (laughs) That's my opinion is that probably they might have been um, ETs themselves because for a long time I've been kind of hoping one would come by the the fair. I just figured as crazy as the fair looks, you could have any kind of disguise or not wear anything and no one would even look at you. I could assume that it was, you know, a costume or something. Anybody could show up. But I had a couple come by, and they actually played it right back to me, where they just stared. I pulled out a, a, a crop circle pendant that I could see them looking at, and they just, yeah, that's right. You know, what can you tell me about it? And then they just stared again, and they weren't, it was like they were firing the images at me. I realized it, this wasn't my game anymore, and then I started wondering what they were. And after they left, it was like you'd get kind of a numbness that just suddenly wore off, and you went, oh, my God, this is what I've been hoping for for years, and I didn't even recognize it. And now they're gone. And so I was waiting for them to come back because it was a dead end at the end of the fair on that road there, and I wait for until closing, and they never did come back. <laughs> they flew on. And there was nowhere else to go. <laughs> I was. I remember joking. Say, I will. I shall see thee on the rebound. You know, making it Renaissance talk, and they just smiled and kept walking. <laughs> my husband and, and I, I went. Didn't. My husband and I went to the Pennsylvania Renaissance Fair. This was like must have been 15 years ago, and he actually bought a puffy shirt, and I bought this little outfit with a, what do you call that? A corset. And oh let yeah, me t- let me tell you something. Those things are great. They make you look so skinny and your boobs look real huge. And and you mm-hmm. and you walk in perfect posture. Like mm-hmm. it they really were great. However, I could see on a hot day where it might be a little constricting. But um I loved it cuz I had no straps, you know, it was just uh so we walked around the fair and we ate the turkey and we had such a marvelous time and uh I imagine they were all pretty the same. Uh, around the country, they're kind of they have the duel and all that kind of stuff, and 
Mm-hmm. And the There's all wine kinds. tasting. Yeah. Yeah. The ones in, in California, I think, were the originals. They were started by Phyllis and Ron Patterson that were teachers. Oh. And they were, it was a, a way of teaching kids history is how it started off. Oh, that and sounds like a And then after like a while, there were some crafts people. Yeah, some craftspeople came in, and then it slowly grew, essentially. And then other ones started potting off over, you know, the rest of the United States. But I think we're maybe in the original. And I just started in California. (laughs) Yeah, it's nice. What are some of the experiences that you had throughout the years? And can you tell the listeners a little bit about the Italian couple and the cabin next to you? Let me tell you, that that freaked me out so you definitely have psychic ability and you might be switching timelines <laughs> well i here's what i'm i'm not sure about this the italian thing um i i don't really have an italian connection so i'm wondering if that might be maybe gotten stuck with something else oh maybe in a cabin next to me yeah i don't i don't recall it it was I, i'm kind of wondering if that got confused maybe with somebody else there because I don't speak Italian or anything. Oh, I know. Uh, yeah, it was, um, I think you said there. Were, you heard, you were in a cabin and the cabin next to you uh, was empty. But all of a sudden, one evening, you heard a lot of noise and it, you, you heard a car pull up and there were a couple of people oh, no, there. That's, that, that wasn't me. Actually, I was talking with a friend that was the native lady, I think we're talking about. Oh, the native lady in, had that. Okay, yeah. that's, that's, why was, Italian, that's why I thought you spoke Italian. That's why I thought you spoke Italian. Because I thought it was you. So, because you, she understood the conversation. Well, she what, what happened with her was she was upstairs as a kid. She was studying and she heard people at her um, grandparents' place where she was staying. And she heard a car pull up and she heard somebody open the door and close it and stomp into the kitchen. And and she was kind of glad someone was home. So she went downstairs to take a look, but there was nobody there. And the cat was sitting on the chair and just staring at her. And he said their eyes were humongous, like he had seen something that a cat can't talk about. And she was so shocked that she just went back upstairs and waited till she heard somebody else show up. But she was talking about, she used to hear um, voices a lot of times at night when she was falling asleep. And she asked her her mom about, her grandmother about it. And she was saying that she thought those were the sounds from hell. I mean, she thought she was hearing a party outside, but she'd open the window and there's nothing there. And she'd close it again and she'd start to hear them again. Yeah, it was it was an interesting house. I, I was asking her really because of everything that had happened in that house, whether or not she thought it might be haunted. But she said her her folks were really traditional, and they were kind of afraid that if you talked about these things, it was like bringing them in. So they told her a little bit, you know, about how how you see witches, for example, things like that. But they didn't get into them all that much outside of that. Yeah, it seemed like there was somebody in that house because she said several times when she was taking a snooze, somebody would come up and touch her cheek, and there was no one there either. Hmm. But you you but also was, had the experience of the clocks in your house. Yes, yeah, that was that was interesting. That was a ghost also, but that was, was a really, ghost. I I didn't even see her as a ghost because she was so friendly and she was so mischievous. <laughs> that you didn't feel any, I, I just felt like she was a friend, you know? We we bought a, a piece of property to build a house on in this old gold mining area that used to have a lot of people. But there was nobody there anymore. But there were still a few old houses standing along the river. And we moved in and we started feeling that there was somebody there. And we were working in town in a jewelry shop. So we were just staying on the weekends <laughs> building the house would come back about well Friday afternoon you know and I'd get there and I'd be thinking well it's time to make dinner I think what time is it and I'd look around for our battery clock and it would be gone and it would take me a minute and I think oh it's right you know and then I'd get down the floor and I'd start looking around under the sofas because she always hit them there and it was 
I could always find it was under we only had a couple sofas. It wasn't a big house, so it didn't take long, but it was like her joke or something. And we could tell that she was female. Terry could feel her too. There was times we could both feel her there. But we were wondering who she might be. That was the tricky part. And then a synchronicity would happen. <clears throat> we ran into a, um, a forester that lived right across the river from us that had been doing a history on the area. And he was able to tell us something about the people that had lived there. I don't know if you read the story. It was kind of funny. Apparently, this lady and her husband lived on the bottom house, which was still there. And up at the top house, which has disappeared, was our property now. There was a bachelor living. And her husband and the bachelor really hated each other, but neither oh, one yeah, of them was yeah. going to move because, yeah, they would, it would be like, well, you know, if I move, that means he won, you know, so they were going to stay there till they died. <laughs> so her husband died, and then she moved in with the bachelor within the week. <laughs> oh, my God. So yeah, apparently they funny. didn't hate each other all that much. <laughs> but so she was used to living, I guess, up where we had in her later years. We never saw her, but Terry's brother did, which cracked me up because he was the biggest skeptic I knew, you know, and I think that's the people it always happens to. But he was sleeping in his truck because there was no room in the house and it was a, a hot night. And he was sleeping at one of those trucks that has the long um, seats, you know, they're not bucket seats, so you could do it. But he was a little nervous because there was a mountain lion up the draw and we'd heard it screaming and. And he had to leave the windows open to get air. So he woke up in the middle of the night and he said he just woke up feeling that something was looking at him. And he saw a mountain lion immediately and he looked out the windows and there was a full moon. So he could see there was nothing out there. And so then he was awake still. So he kind of turns around and to behind him just about and he said there was a woman looking in through the window. And she had one of those old tiny hats, you know, that covers the, it used to call them, I think, a, a cold, bonnet. A bonnet. cold bucket hat or something. Bonnet or something. It, it, yeah, it, 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 it covered the front of her head, so you couldn't really see her face, plus the moon was behind it. And he said the, the interesting thing was that she seemed to be almost grayish, translucent and grayish, but she had an armful of of flowers that were so bright, it was like technicolor. They were almost like glowing from inside. And she was just staring at him. She wasn't doing anything. And he stared at her for a while and kind of got bored because she wasn't doing anything. And he just lay down and went back to sleep. But I always wondered about those flowers. You know, I got wondering if she, if she saw us as new neighbors or something and she was trying to welcome us. That's what I'm getting. And I'm sure you, yeah, I thought, I'm sure our house really threw her because it was pentagonal, which was nothing. I'm sure that she, it probably looked like a spaceship that landed there. That was actually our second round house in a row hmm. that we built. <laughs> but anyway, and so, you know, we were really curious, you know, about who she might be. We never did find her name, though, and that's really what I wanted to know. I, it was funny. We finally ended up selling the place because we got a, an inn at the Ren Fair. And we just couldn't live that far out and do that, too. And so we sold it to some folks that did garlic wreaths for fairs, other fair people. And they really loved it. They were really into being out in the boonies, too. And we became friends with them. And after a couple of weeks, I remember after well, it was about a month after we finally sold it, we came up just to visit them, you know, and. They were going to put in an airfield. They had all these plans. And just as we were getting ready to leave, the lady there asked me, do you know you've got a ghost? And it, I'd forgotten all about it. We'd been gone for so long in town making jewelry and other things, and I'd forgot to even mention it. And I said, well, how do you know? And she said, oh, well, it's the clocks. She keeps moving them. <laughs> Oh, that's her thing. Wow. The the same tra- that was her thing, I guess. Yeah. And she also felt, she said she felt that she was just, it was her joke. She felt that she was very friendly, whoever she was. It was like having a neighbor, you know, and there was no neighbors up there. So she kind of liked it. So that was the last that I heard. Well, we're. I would have liked it if she had name, though. 
Yeah, it's, it's so nice funny. to know Just who calling they, you the lady. Yeah, you want to call them by their name, and especially yeah. her. She was so nice. Well, you had many. Oh, yeah. She's there all the time. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're going to get ready to go on break, and there's a few more questions I want to ask you, and then we can get into our discussion on the ascension process. And actually, there's one story in your book where you have a dream, and that kind of goes into the future uh, to a yeah. world that's already ascended. So um, we're going to take a break now. You're listening to Starburn Connection Radio on KGRA.com, and this is Julia Weiss and Michael and Bill and Millennia. We'll be back in just a few minutes. People are waking up. They're standing up to those pushing pesticides and GMOs as safe alternatives for a starving world. What about your crap? I tell you, I'd rather eat dirt. So, I drink Life Change Tea. It's an herbal drink, cleansing my body of toxic sludge and nasty chemicals, and of course, ridding the intruders that are hidden in my so-called food. And by the way, Life Change Tea is non-GMO and organic. No fillers, no yuck. Just a great defense against you-know-what. May the supplement force awaken you. Don't fall to the dark side. Oh, uh, sorry. <laughs> I went to the movies last night. Anyway, enough said. How do you get that herbal drink and change your life? Get the tea.com. That's get the tea.com. You will awaken. You will get stronger. And you might even lose a bit of weight. So awaken to life change tea and the many one of a kind supplements at get the tea.com. That's get the tea.com. May the supplement force be with you. Luis Elizondo is making headlines around the world. He can be seen on every Every major news network because he disclosed that he's been working on a secret UFO program with the Department of Defense and he wants to address the UFO community who he says inspired him to release this information and you can only hear this at the 2018 International UFO Congress tickets are going fast for the 2018 International UFO Congress get yours at ufocongress.com Linda Howe, Steve Bassett Don Schmidt and Michael Carter are just just a few names you may recognize. However, the UFO Congress is also famous for bringing new, exciting UFO information to our attendees. Find out more about the incredible lineup we have put together at ufocongress.com. The UFO Congress is in February 2018 in the beautiful desert outside of Mountain Hills, Arizona. We look forward to seeing you there. Get your tickets at ufocongress.com. For years, the KGRA Digital Broadcast Station has been your contact for live UFO paranormal talk radio worldwide, bringing you the top names in research and investigations seven nights a week. Our listeners connect to the KGRA on various platforms like TalkStream Live, TuneIn, Spreaker, iTunes, iHeartRadio, and many more. Now, you can stream your favorite paranormal talk radio shows with our new fully integrated custom KGRA mobile apps for Android and iPhones. Listen to your favorite paranormal talk shows from any mobile device 24-7 free with smartphone or tablet. Utilize custom features to access news, show pages, archives, contests, events, and live interactive chat room. Set, set show notification alerts and never miss your favorite live programs. All free and available to download in Google Play or the iTunes App Store. Mainstream media's most wanted. KGRARadio.com Welcome back to Starburn Connection Radio on KGRA.com. This is Julia, and we're here with Belenia, and Michael has a short announcement to make. Go ahead, Mike. Very, very briefly. Uh, a little message from uh, Ilona saying that uh, next Saturday we may get a communication. Okay. Okay. So that and that's that. That's, that's all I'll say. That's all I can say because that's all she sent me. So. Okay. <laughs> well, um, Valenia, the um, 
next thing was that you had this lucid dream or I uh, can you explain mm -hmm. the dream about the new earth? Yeah, it um, it started off as a lucid dream. Um, basically, um, it began, I came into awareness anyway, and I was in the middle of a um, UFO of the kind um, that you hear about in Tepotzlan, one of the ones the, that Carlos Diaz talks about that are supposedly actually aware and um, sentient. And what I, the reason that I recognized it was the red lights along the sides, which apparently you can see on the inside. And he'd mentioned once before that they were not lights so much as doors, but you could actually go through them. And that's probably hmm. why I recognized it right away, because I would have thought, you know, lights. I, I really wouldn't have thought that far. But I woke up lucidly. I was all alone. I was inside of the saucer. It, was, it seemed to be one of the plasma crafts that they talk about in Tepoztlan. And I was informed by entities that I couldn't see but that were in there with me. And it was telling me that the doors, orange-red doors, that were all around me, they all opened up into the same time frame but in the future of the United States and in six hmm. different places, even though they were in one, I don't know how this worked, but in different parts of the U.S. And they said that five of them opened up into areas inside cities, and one of them opened up into the woods in one place. And they asked me if I'd like to see the future. Huh. And so I thought about it, and I said, well, I think I would go into the door into the woods, because I want to see before I get myself into anything you know, what's going on in the future here, whether it's dangerous or whatever, and they seem to understand that. So I stepped through the light, crouched down, and crawled out of what seemed like a big hole under a root, something like a bear or a badger might be in. It, and I looked around, and I seemed to be in a large park, except there was huge trees all the way around, except that it looked kind of artificial, and it took me a minute to figure out that there were actually the, in the ruins of giant foundations. And I realized I'm actually in a city, or what well, was a city, but it's gone now, and there's huge trees, so it must have been some years after it came down. And while I'm watching, there's two young men that are kind of walking into view, and I realized they're walking along a path, and they're carrying picks, and they're talking about working on a footbridge. And so I fall in behind them, make them up. To, they ended up at a kiosk where a lady, they talked with a lady for a while, and she gave me these little tokens, which kind of irritated me because they were being paid, essentially, is what it was. And I was thinking, well, that's kind of, you know, cheap. And they just laughed. You know, they thought it was funny. I said, well, what should they give us? And they, and, you know, they explained that basically um, – they didn't have money in the sense that we had anymore. These things were like, they were tokens that showing that they had paid what they owed. You know, everybody owed so many hours, basically to what, I should call it the, the social commonwealth or something. They'd find something that they did well, they'd volunteer, and then they'd give them something, you know, as a token of their work. And you couldn't really, you didn't, spend it or anything. Some people collected them, but you didn't have to. It was just an acknowledgement. Basically, all the data was in a bank somewhere, so it, you know, they knew that you did. But they really, it was like a world after money. You know, there was a time before money, but you, you don't assume that there would ever be a time after money. But apparently things had kind of shifted down to more of a ground level and um, there was more trade going on than there used to be. And you were basically given or you had a right to certain things that were just for living. And then your work took about four hours of the day, which gave you about four hours to do whatever you wanted to or even have a little business or whatever, tend your garden, whatever. And um, they seemed really happy with it. It was capitalism. It was still there. You know, there was a, a large amount of what you call socialism, but it seemed a good mix. It was a good balance that they seemed to be happy with. And it was all on the bottom level, which is what got me. Everything was kind of like a co-op level. 
the government was kind of a co-op level, the way that they distributed food and such. But it, it seemed to work. And I asked them about the, the trees and the park and everything. And, and they, because it looked kind of grim to me, I was thinking, well, was it the nuclear, you know, did it go off or something? Did we have the third world war? And, and they said, no, actually there was just a long time of really hard times that came up. And it could have been maybe a 50 year span or so where people just, things kind of broke down in the cities and people started moving out into the country just because they couldn't really exist in the cities anymore. And they just started pulling down the buildings essentially and hauled them off for houses and barns and stuff like that. And they showed me actually that they did have money in a sense, but it was like plastic tokens. They kind of used it if they had to travel up out of the area and, People didn't use them much. They weren't in the sense of money as we think of them today. But I never asked the right questions like, when was the year? You know, <laughs> what year is this? That's one of the things I should have asked, you know. I had a sense that it was somewhere in the, the northeast, or not east maybe, but around Chicago area. I don't know why I got this feeling there, but that's what it seems like to me. Wow. Yeah, I mean, the future could... Go ahead. No, I wasn't, I wasn't going to say anything there. <laughs> well, it sounds like the kind of future that when I go into my meditations, of course, I'm not asking for any disaster to happen or droughts or anything that would cause people to leave the cities. But, you know, I, I want the transition to New Earth to be easy and gentle and of course I see in my vision we're in like really modern houses and really modern towns and cities but they're they're clean they're very very clean there's no dirt there's no actual cars we can actually I think they have those hover feet you know that the, there's mm -hmm. vehicles that can hover and of course there's unlimited electricity is supplied or energy or power, um, that's mm -hmm. a given. Uh, your education is supplied, and you can go anywhere. Like uh, some people also were confirming through channeling and visions where, you know, you could just pick, you know, when you're in school, most of the school is outside in nature. Uh, as it should be. Yeah. yeah, and then they connect you with nature and teach you meditation, teach little kids, you know, and, and of course it's different. Like in my world, there's a lot of teachers because mm -hmm. you're not going to have 20 kids in a room. You're going to have maybe four or five kids that you work with. And um, uh -huh. so you can get to know them and what their talents are and what their interests are. And then you uh, school becomes exciting because then what you're doing is you're, you're training them with things they love and enjoy and you're you know you mm -hmm. can find teachers you know you can still go to different teachers like they have in in school now you go to your art teacher your music teacher you have different teachers but your general teacher like your is just maybe four or five kids and then they can really know like and of course the kids that are being born uh now are so smart um Mm -hmm. And they have a lot of their gifts already. They're already 24 strand DNA. They're already remembering their past lives. So it's not like the teachers have a really hard job. But of course, you know, we're going to find out the correct physics, the correct history. Mm -hmm. Like all that's going to be taught. And of course, people can go to vocational schools. They can go to whatever subject they're interested in. I mean, universities will be open. You won't have to pay. Mm -hmm. And um, and then it absolutely makes sense that when all these basic needs are covered and your health care is covered, and of course, you're not taking pills anymore, uh, the health care would obviously be holistic. And, um, and we'll probably do a lot of our own healing and as well. Mm -hmm. And... Um, and what was the other vision? Um, all the, and of course, yeah, the government would be more cooperative. We would have smaller towns and villages instead of like a, 
it would be more localized. I mean, we, we might have a big nation where there is a central government, but basically the state and local have a lot mm -hmm. more power. And, um, and then, of course, all the technology of the release that they've been holding, that really is a big deal. We each have our different heaven on earth. And some people do like to be in a big city. Some people like mm -hmm. to be out in the country and, and we have different kind of, you know, and it's not that you're given stuff for free and you're just sitting and doing nothing. The human, we want to be connected to one another. We'll be connected anyway through telepathy and we'll really feel, feel our connection to one another and source. So we're going to want to work. We're not going to want to stay in the house all day. We're going to want to connect with other people. And of course, with free education, you can really learn. You know, and maybe there would be like, mm -hmm. if you worked extra hours, you got luxury tokens so you could travel to another country and that kind of stuff. You know, there could be extra That's stuff. What it sounded. Yeah. yeah, yeah, they could do extra stuff. Thinking. I was also thinking that, you know, I'm wondering if I had gone, if I had chosen to go into a city because I was in a park, that there might still be cities, either old cities or new cities, that were the ones that you're describing. I just happened to pick the woods because they, they gave me the choice of five places and four of them were cities. So they were still happening, apparently. Oh, well, my vision is like really modern buildings very futuristic, mm -hmm. nothing really, really talk. Um, I like a city that's spread out and I don't know about you, but I'm not comfortable in tall buildings. <laughs> I, mm -hmm. I, I would, you know, but I would like like a, an opera house, you know, plays, theaters, you know, the city has all, like it used to be where the city has all the central stuff but you live close enough to the city that you could walk to it or, or take one of these little scooters over. You know, it's not a big, yeah. it's not a half hour commute. You're, the city's basically there and you're in the outskirts. Um, that's what I would like to be able to just walk yeah. to a center square, but still have my big backyard and still be able to grow my own stuff. And, um, and of course, the earth, the ground, the air is clean. You know, all the new technology cleaned everything up. And um, so it's a very, it was the way we were meant to live when we were originally created by the mm -hmm. creator. We were supposed to develop spiritually. And of course, there were hijackers along the way. And we got into the money mm -hmm. system and, and survive and, you know, a flight and survive kind of attitude. And once we're, f and we're now declaring our freedom and our sovereignty from all other beings that are doing this. So slowly but surely, uh, the society will be moving and hopefully with ease and grace, uh, that's the timeline I want. I don't, of course, we don't want war. We don't want any major, you know, disaster happening. We want, justice and i see it actually happening now where mankind that i see so many changes that a, a lot of people yeah. don't see these changes yet because but it's, i'm starting to see yeah they're invisible <laughs> in a lot of ways it's like you can see the waves but you can't see the fish but you can tell something's moving because you can see what's changing because of it i really see in people's perspectives, things that they used to just go along with and say, oh, that's just how things are, suddenly oh, yeah. they're just outraged. And they're going, no, we're oh, not thinking. Interested. Thinking is totally different now. Yeah. And I, I think that there's a lot of the old guard that's not really understanding what's going on. But a long time ago, you know, I was reading when the changes came, the whole the idea that people that were listening, there was like a door on the top of their head and they would hear these and they would know what to do. But there was a lot of people that door wasn't open. And unfortunately, I think right now, a lot of those are in government and they would not understand what was going on. It would baffle them because they could see the change, but they couldn't, they didn't know why would it changed because they weren't listening. They couldn't listen. And I think really that's the part that's our strength is that we can hear this stuff, and there's people that are 
those that are stuck with the old ways, the greed, you know, the fear, they can't hear it. So they can't attack it. So you have the... It, it is a, yeah, you have the I younger people. Lot. Yes, I'm seeing that a lot in the kids. It's like, it's almost like there's this new computer version and the old world keeps trying to stick in old programs and say, these it's computers are screwed up. Yeah, but, exactly. We'll make the new programs. They'll work just fine. So but these that part kids, has, we're, mm-hmm. we can't see each other, so it's hard to see when, when we're done. But um, I didn't mean to interrupt, but it's um, the new kids that are starting to go to work, uh, the yes. early, you know, the kids that are 18, 19, 20, they don't believe in Republican and Democrat anymore. They want something different. That. They're not even it's voting. Super. They're like, um, and mm-hmm. and they're also, and then they're also heart centered. So when you're when your mind that the politicians don't see it now because they're still working from their head. But when we go from our head to our hearts, we can start seeing all the changes. And um, I actually saw something the other day, or I was, I'm always asking for proof of ascension. Not because yes. I don't believe it, but it really encourages me when I start seeing a change in paradigm. And it could be anything. Mm-hmm. You know, right now we have the women's movement where mm-hmm. women that have been sexually it abused. never would have happened 20 years no. ago. No, and they're, 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 what was different is, and I know I was in the corporate world for a long time, you know, it happened to me, it happened to my friends, but we kept quiet because if I lose this job, exactly. uh, I, I'm going to be in another social level. Like, we need this job so I can keep my house, and no one else is going to hire me. Remember Sue? Mm-hmm. Remember what it's happened to quality. Sue? Nobody's going to hire mm-hmm. her now because she opened her mouth, and that was was going on. I mean, I didn't, I didn't have too yes. much of it, but I knew it was going on. I had... You know, we did a lot of flirting and that I'm a strong person. It didn't really bother me. But there was a salesman at one of my jobs that tried to touch me and he made a lot of jokes. And and I went to his boss many times. Oh, that's just this guy. He's just a lark. And I'm like, no, yeah, that's so, just you. Mm-hmm. But now you see all these women defending each other all from all different industries it's not just hollywood it's other industries and that's all coming out and then hopefully other stuff will come out but this was really interesting when i was asking those questions in meditation it was interesting because i was watching the news i don't i don't watch as much as news as i usually do but this was pbs and they have a lot of human interest stories that i like to watch and Mm -hmm. So uh, I saw a, a story about two artists. They met at an, uh, a college, I think, I'm not sure exactly where, it might have been Baltimore, because that's where the museum is that has their art. But there were two college students that met in an art class. Um, and one of the artists was a gentleman that came here when he was a teenager. He's from Japan. And his grandfather was in Hiroshima. So his grandfather Ooh. experienced the nuclear explosion. He lived through it, but he died 30 years later from cancer wow. related to the radiation poisoning. The other guy was American. And this is so freaky. His grandfather worked in Los Alamos on the Manhattan Project. He was one oh. of the scientists that or he was an engineer that drew the um atom bomb and he had when the war was over they had a lot of nightmares the guys that worked on that project can you imagine the guilt i mean i mean you want to do something for your country but i don't think people realize what the results would be and how horrible yeah they would be they were just feeling desperate yeah yeah so um these two guys, they were really, really busy, but one day they ended up having lunch together and they started talking about their backgrounds. So they both said that they had a mission and their mission was to make sure there's no more nuclear weapons 
and mm. that it's off the charts. So they they created this amazing art project, and they now are at the Baltimore Museum. If anybody's in the Baltimore area, it's now. So check it out. It's the Baltimore. I guess it's their art museum there. I'm not sure what the name is, but there's a big, huge room. And this room is only their artwork. And it's very simple. It's just red uh, rectangle paper on the floor. It looks like they put down red towels. There's like thousands of them, of these red cray paper or something. And you see in the red paper, it looks like an x-ray. Uh, each mm -hmm. one has a mm. different person mm -hmm. it's a different it's a person lying down in different movements and you could see maybe a little bone here and there it looks like an x-ray so the japanese guy was saying uh if this was like five or six years ago they'd never be able to get that art out because they were they didn't want any politically incorrect stuff or anything that would disturb people they just wanted art that people could put on their wall um, mm -hmm. but he actually said, we are in a new paradigm and, uh, the thinking is so different now. Um, and I'm just trying to think, I wrote a little thing on it, um, that people are thinking totally different now and now it's okay to do something like this. And that was so cool to hear because, um, you know, to hear a story, and that wasn't the only story. There were a lot of other things. I'm going to go in in a little bit about the Olympics. Um, I saw the opening ceremonies of the Olympics last night, and it was full of symbols of ascension. And I don't know, really? Valenia, if I you... I didn't see it. Well, Valenia, what I don't they? know. It was Friday night, and you can still see it. If it, it's on demand, you know, if you have cable, you can go into the uh, on demand and find it. It's, it's, I believe, it's NBC, um, mm -hmm. and, and you could see it on the NBC app on the computer, I believe. Um, well, but what did that, you get out of it? That's what I'm curious. What did oh, you see? Oh, I'm going to tell you. I'm going to tell you. It was amazing. Um, I'm starting to see ascension symbols everywhere. Not so much just the symbols, but the um, just changing in thought and changing in paradigm. Um, mm -hmm. So the the ceremony itself was incredible. The artwork and the artistry was unbelievable. And there were so many symbols of the ascension process. I, I find it very interesting that now at this time when we are the when we as a collective are all waking up to these symbols that are appearing uh, and it really shows that we are truly are moving forward to a new paradigm. So uh, the first symbol was the Korean flag. The flag is a yin uh -huh. and the yang symbol, right? And the colors oh. are red and blue. So to me, it hit me immediately when I saw Ooh. the flag. It was a symbol mm -hmm. of masculine and feminine energy uniting in balance and also the negative and positive uniting because we have to embrace our negative and our positive. We have to integrate mm -hmm. everything to be a full person. And I believe masculine energy is usually violet. And in the flag, I think they just had it as red. And the feminine energy is green. So I saw that as the blue because blue has green in it but um it might mean something else to the koreans but that's what i got out of it so here here we're having the olympics in korea that their furry flag is about balance and harmony the second thing was the whole artistic show was showing the balance of nature the harmony of animals humans and the environment there were tigers and dragons and phoenixes which are all symbols of abundance protection and transmutation that's the big one transmuting mm -hmm. all our bad yeah, stuff the phoenix mm -hmm. so there was a show um also at the future of korea where they showed all the new technologies so um there was a theme um where they showed holograms uh where they uh 
there was a guy doing an operation and you he literally there was a hologram of the heart he was doing stuff in the heart so that was pretty amazing uh there was cars that were flying and then they showed people going from work and going to meditation classes in this video that they had so they were showing um the balance that they have a good the, the announcer that was announcing you know how they kind of talk about the show so you understand what's going on mm -hmm. so they were talking about um that in the korean culture it's all about harmony and balance and that they're balancing the technology all this new technology with uh, meditating and, and a spiritual life you have to have balance you can't be all work and, and not have balance and the next thing which is a very big thing uh, when, when everybody was marching in uh, the North Koreans were marching in as one team with the South Koreans this is unprecedented the whole audience stood up and cheered the sister of Kim, the leader of North Korea, was at the Olympics, seated behind the vice president. Um, so they were in the VIP booth. Then during the lighting of the flame, there were two young girls, one North Korean, one South Korean, that ran up the stairway with the torch before handing it to the skater, which was at the top. There was a skater that actually lit the torch. So... Um, I did hear from several people that channel information and psychics that predicted North and South Korea would be one nation this year. And I thought to myself, how can that actually be? Oh. It, it would have to be a war or something would have to happen major because there's just not enough time for that to happen. Yeah, and it's just so different still. So they, yeah, hmm. so they must have gotten it out of context they, they did come together, but it was mm -hmm. during a sports venue, which is actually pretty mm -hmm. big. It's mostly young people. And it was so amazing that, to see this attempt at peacemaking. With all the warmongering going on between our president and Kim, this was a great yes. sign that the young people wanted something different. And there also it's is a, a new... Block them. Yeah. Well, I think it's a good way to block him. You know, when they're coming together while he's trying to tear them apart. Well, that's the old paradigm. It would be a way of blocking the thing. Yeah. yeah so I have a bigger bomb than you have. You know, yeah. this instilling kind of fighting. So there's also a new president of the Olympic Games. The old one was asked to res or did resign because of stuff coming out. You know, the whole gymnastics thing. Mm -hmm. uh, right. And there's new energy all around. There's a new leadership in South Korea, a new president. The young people went to the streets. Uh, the young people uh, got that taken care of. Mm -hmm. And there's, let's see what else happened. Uh, so the president was stating, the president of the Olympics, his speech was about the peaceful effort of combining the two nations. Through sports and achievement, we can work together and have fun despite our cultural differences. He spoke of a different way of thinking. It was about embracing what we have in common, despite our politics and language and cultural differences. To me, this was a pure sign of the ascension process at work. I could not help watching the whole artistic presentation, finding many more symbols and signs of a new paradigm and a new way of thinking. And it was so glorious because um, the timing was just so perfect this is the year where everything starts to get revealed and so many mm -hmm. people are becoming mm -hmm. awake and aware and we had all these major eclipses and things happening so it just fit that they had the Olympics in Korea and the whole show it, it wasn't about I'm better than you it was really about the unity and you could see the young children or they're not young children, they're teenagers and in their early 20s, but you can really see how the young people don't want any of the mess anymore. They, they want to be, they want to do what they enjoy and share their talents and make a better world. And that was beautiful. Yeah. They can see how dysfunctional it is. I'm sure, you know, it, it, it's not the way they work inside. 
I, that find it so fascinating that this is symbols that you're seeing at the Olympics, though, because you always think of that as the, the ultimate in competition. You know, my country is better than yours and such. And instead, they're turning into a cooperative thing, which sounds, I don't know, I, I like it a lot more. I, you know, it reminded me, just off the wall for a quick one, but Mon- Monroe, Robert Monroe and Travels Out of the Body, he actually went to the future at one point, and he was watching, he's saying the, the Eastern and the Western world had, had formed blocks, but they were friendly, and they had things that, like you're saying, the um, Olympics, but the whole thing was, it was a friendly competition, almost like a game, you know, it wasn't, uh, there wasn't any, what do you call, meanness or one-upsmanship anymore. Right, right. A different attitude, doing the same thing, but with a different attitude. And it sounded a lot like what you were talking about. Uh, that may be where it's going is what I'm thinking. Yeah, and I think but we... But it's the Olympics. Yeah. Well, everybody saw it. And, you know, the codes, I really believe in light language codes. And I could definitely see them coming out from the artwork. Um, mm-hmm. The art presentation. There were five kids that went into a cave. They discovered all the artifacts and then they went into the history of Korea and then all the animals and the people and you could just feel the codes you know you could just feel the beauty of it all and it was really amazing and but it's it's just amazing how everything just works together so you could see a whole new paradigm it is true that these new kids coming in, they just have a different sense of thinking. Uh, the old way of thinking is very masculine, very controlling, whereas the new way is the combining of the masculine and feminine equal. Mm-hmm. Right now, the yeah. female, right now the feminine energy is really pouring in. That's why you're hearing so much right now with the Me Too movement and all that business. But eventually we're going to meld together. But, and it's very rough because right now a lot of people are getting discouraged because they don't see enough change, but change is happening and you can't just light a match and there it goes. I mean, there's, mm-hmm. in the you spiritual. You can't pro- nail it on. You no, it has nail to. It on. If you don't let it grow, it doesn't take, you Spirituality know, to takes time. It. It doesn't, yeah. Yeah, it took me like seven years to get to this point where I started meditating every day and started my spiritual gifts came out. It didn't happen all at once. So it's um, with society, it's, if, if we want everything to change with ease and grace, it's going to have to go slow. You know, otherwise some major event might happen and we don't want that. We don't want an earthquake mm-hmm. or, a, you know, so this is how it goes. But I do see science everywhere they're starting to clean up the water they're starting to get rid of the plastics that are in the ocean these funky little inventions that young people invent 18 19 year olds yeah. huh. i know it so much of it is the young kids but they have the different mind and and they're not in such it's funny it's almost like we've been growing up in this numb denial kind of for a long time that oh there's terrible things happening but what can you do i'm only one person and it, it's like uh-huh. they're not even choosing they just are different everything is going to change because they're not the same where it, it's kind of an inside job and it wasn't it, it kind of well like they're yeah. going to grow it from the inside out rather than try to nail it from the outside in and I think it's working. I've really noticed. One thing I really noticed, it seemed like long ago I would see kids like that, but there wasn't a lot of them. Right. And they usually seemed to show up in families that were a lot like them. The last, I'd say, 15, 20 years, um, it's funny, about the same time when I started to feel that it was okay to talk about my own situation, because I used to start shaking, and I knew that it was a shutdown. It was like, don't talk. And then oh. suddenly it was okay. And the thing that went with it, what they were saying was, it's okay because there's enough of us now. They can't stop us. And I, I finally realized what they were talking about was just there's more kids 
but they're being born into non, what would you say, non-traditional families where right. they don't quite fit, you know, and they, it's like they need more uncles <laughs> and aunts to try to help them make sense. The, I don't know what you call <laughs> forerunners or something, because a lot of the parents really don't appreciate them. It's, it's not their fault. You know, it's just they're not like them. Like they'll say, oh, they're oversensitive. I don't know what happened, you know. Right. Or well, why are you playing with that lizard or whatever? You know, <laughs> do something useful. <laughs> it was a kid. They also care. don't have this. Watching? They also uh-huh. don't have the same money. You know, the wanting to be yeah. so rich. You know, there's a guy mm-hmm. that just. Here's another thing. A guy, just a young guy, 20 years old won the lottery he's from florida and i believe it was a big one like 400 million or something the first thing he said yeah. was i'm going to help humanity i mean that was just amazing wow you know, i'm That's going to help humanity it was the, yeah it wasn't oh i'm going to pay off my parents house i'm gonna i'm sure he'll do all those things but he, he had a heart for humanity for he projects a big picture yeah yeah and it was really beautiful so where can people find your book Linnea? amazon.com good old amazon the, yeah it's just it's under the title there reflections from a crop circle case and if they really want one that's signed they can Try to, I think you hop. Can you hop on a Facebook and say anything? <laughs> I'm not sure because I was saying, send me your address, or a, you know, and a check, and I'll send you a signed copy too. You can on private chat, I guess. Um, I guess, but Amazon will do well too. That's the quick way, anyway. It is a quick way, and of course, if they see you at your booth, if they go to the Renaissance Fair. <laughs> Or another conference. Well, they won't do that. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm still trying to get into some UFO conferences this year. It's been forever. But doing the Renaissance Fair is really hard. As far as where we're at now, we basically lose money just in the traveling. Oh. We have a manager that's like one of our old, old-term friends, and he does the booth now. We're back into our 60s. I'm kind of – I do the jewelry. I really enjoy doing jewelry, but – I don't have the energy to do every weekend at fair running down oh, to California yeah. and back from Oregon. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Quite a waste. It was great, though. And I'm really looking forward to getting back into the UFO shows. It's been a long time. Hoping yeah. to start this again, start this, this year, because I, there was just outside of the energy, there's just so much information. You just can write off it for, you know, I could write off it for years. That's what got me started on prints again and doing the, you know, the Sumerian studies was the energy that you get from the other people there. Mm. You know, like I said, it's our tribe. You know, it's energizing. Oh, it's about exciting. the Sumerian, I wanted to ask you about that. Um, did you find anything out interesting? Yeah, I found it was interesting. I, I went out of the, my way not to study Zachariah Sitchin for a while because I didn't want him to influence me. And once I actually did, once I knew enough Sumerian that I felt comfortable doing it, I realized I pretty much agreed with him in everything. And I'm amazed that he managed to figure out so much that was in total contradiction to what everyone else was saying at the time. I think that it, it kind of like Freud with sex, that after a point, he start, everything had to do with it in every culture. And there was a few things I kind of disagreed with on that, but when he stuck to Samaria, there's a few things too. I, I've been grabbing copies of various things like the Gudean um, cylinders and um, to re retranslate. And some of the things that he was saying about um, spaceships coming off the tops, I'm not quite so sure it wasn't hyperbole about the size of the, of the ziggurats, but there's other stuff in there that's even curiouser that really reminds me of present day experiencers. Mm-hmm. This one, um, a city, a uh, kind of a city <laughs> king there. It, this is the Gudean um, cylinders. And he was deciding that um, he needed the gods to show up for the lords because they weren't getting any rain. And apparently this is something that the lords are very good at. 
And so he, he asked the lords what to do, and they, the way they put this, and this will sound so familiar, was that in the middle of the day, he was seized in a dream. He couldn't move, and the gods told him what he needed to do in order to make them happy so that they would come back and give them rain. And, you know, I'm thinking, rain, I said, well, geoengineering, we're starting to do that ourselves. Right. You know, it's not that far in the future. But the part about him being seized in his sleep and told these things, and then when they finally do show up and they decide, yes, we'll come, you know, we like your, you know, we like the palace. This, this, this thing is luxurious. It has lounges. It has parks. This is not something you put statues in. You know, somebody was living here and they were really living good because they're talking about the luxuries, luxuries, fabrics they're getting from everywhere to make these gods happy. And when um, his god comes to take care of the city and give them rain, which he does, he brings 50 of his retinue along, the Anunnaki, which I guess come in groups of 50. And so the people have to take care of them, too. And that apparently was the idea of the temple sacrifices was you've got to feed all these guys. When you look at the first cylinders, they're basically grocery lists for the gods. You know, temple tributes, essentially. Oh, so like in early Judaism, when they had the temple and they would give animal sacrifices, that would go to the mm -hmm. gods. Oh. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know. Oh. And you, it makes you think about other things like, Animal mutilations, they're always going after these cattle, it seems, you know? And isn't it interesting that the blood of these things, from what I've heard, can be extracted to make plasma that apparently humans can use. Really? It's very, very close to ours. So there's something about, they were, I think in some ways they were consuming these critters. I'm not sure in what manner they did, but I think they really were, you know, eating them in some sense, using them. But it's wow. kind of funny. You think about the first cylinders, the first tablets being sacred or something, and they were grocery lists. You know, the scribes were saying, this person gave me three cabbages, but they were dirty and I had to clean them. <laughs> oh, wow. I said, well, it's not much very sacred about that, but it gives you an idea of their culture a little bit. But really what I got out of it, um, when you get into the, the words, the language tells you so much about the way they thought and the way that they worked. And you really got a sense that in the beginning, the Lords owned everything and everything else was allotted. They have a word, ba, which just means you're given this, you're allotted that. You didn't own anything. You gave half of what you made for taxes for the temple, for example. And that Sounds like to today. You. <laughs> it's getting pretty close. I was saying 50%. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Not too different. And you also get a sense at just, uh, maybe neither here nor there, but they talk about the Eskimos having 100 words for snow. And I think with the Sumerians, they had 100 words for goat. Their whole culture was built on small an animal agriculture. Right. And, it's, and you really understand a lot more of the language if you understand that, because so much of it is goat connected. Like you turn your ear to something means you focus on it, because humans don't turn their ears, but goats do. Oh. So you have to understand their their life to understand what they're talking about a lot of times, even. So that was a lot of it for me. Was luckily having lived out in the boonies a lot, I knew critters. And I'd grown plants. So it was more accessible to me in that sense. Hmm. Wow. But yeah, you do get a sense. There's reading the old Sumerian text, the Noah story, for example. I think um, there's a really good um, possibility that it did occur. And it happened in the Black Sea at the time that there were the giant floods after the Ice Age. And that what we call Eden was probably, it sounds like, was um, a, a canyon valley, basically, with a lake in the middle of it. Because they've proven pretty much that before the sea flooded, there were people down there that found artifacts stretching around. And it seems like if you check the languages, 
you will see that it seems like everybody from Turkey, from Israel, from uh, the Vinca and the Kukutnai civilizations all came out of the Black Sea. Hmm. And you can really follow them, you know, as they marched out of the Black Sea, as they escaped the flood, essentially. And you watch, you can watch through time checking the buildings because people would build on top of old buildings. And you watch all the round buildings giving way to these long houses. And you watch the skulls of the newcomers supplanting the ones that used to be there because they had these long, thin skulls. And the people that lived there were small people that had round skulls. So it was definitely, there were different people that came out of this place than there were all around it. Totally, And they had higher technology, too. Hmm. So I'm kind of wondering this part about the God, the hybridization. There might have been something to that, too. In the old, the oldest legends, this is interesting, is that Enki, the, the one that actually um, warns the old the Noah, Utapishtim, in the and the Sumerian and the Babylonian stories. And there's also Atrahazas, the Asudra, and a lot of other Noahs. But it's all the same story. And Enki, the god that warns Noah because he doesn't want, or um, Atrahazas or whichever of them, because he, he feels responsible, you realize you find that this Atrahazas was actually one of his children. It was a hybrid child. And not only that, but it was a hybrid child from a hybrid wife, which means that she was more Anunnaki, uh, or his child was more Anunnaki than he was human. And I'm, I'm thinking, well, I can see Anunnaki's, uh, um, I can see Enki's dilemma right there. He's more us than he is them. We can't allow him to die. And then there's all these in-betweeners. But the problem was, according to their major legend, and they never get into this in the Bible so much, but why is there a flood? According to them, there were just too damn many humans. They didn't expect it, but we spread like flies. And they didn't know what to do with us. And one of the things after the flood, when they decided to let humans live, is the first thing they decided was how to make so many women non-reproductive so this wouldn't happen again. They actually made temple priestesses that would not have any kind of relationships. They would have women that were infertile. The gods or lords or whatever somehow managed to put this into our culture, which is kind of interesting because they don't get into this at all in the Bible. You kind of wonder, well, what was the terrible thing we did? Well, the first thing it says in the Bible is to multiply that was the first yeah. commandment. I think they had no idea. They had a couple different <laughs> guys. Getting into. Yeah. Also, if you get into Sitchin, here's something he never got into that explains so much at the beginning of the Bible. Was which primate did they use? He said it came out of Africa. Well, there's one primate that used to have a wide, much wider span than it does now. It's called a bonobo. And it's not a chimp. It's, it's matriarchal. It's cooperative. It can stand on two legs and carry things, and it's brilliant. It would be a great gold miner for, as Sitchin was saying, except there's one major flaw that comes with it. And um, if you know anything about bonobos, you know they I like I know where you're going. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. All the work stops when you pass an apple tree. <laughs> I don't think it was the breeding exactly that they were upset about. It was all the practicing <laughs> because they weren't getting any work done. All they do is have <laughs> sex, I know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I really think so. Because this sounds like the perfect being in the, in the text, Sumerian text, the, the birth goddesses. They, when they're trying to decide we need a worker, a worker being because the Anunnaki are complaining it's just too much work for them, the little gods. And so the birth goddess says, I know of such a being. It says it already exists. Basically, she was saying, we just need to tweak it a little bit. And I was thinking, well, which one is this? And Sitchin says, well, it was in Africa. The first coal mines were in Africa. So you would expect maybe that it would be in that area. And apparently there were a lot of them running around back then. Which I think is kind of interesting, really, because 
if there was any any critter to make as a base, that would be a good one, really. You know, as primates go, they're very mellow. But I think also <laughs> we were on a natural process of evolution. It was just would have taken mm-hmm. a lot more time. And of course, the different races, we've been seeded by many different races, I'm sure. The Palladians, right. you know, we're, we yeah. all look so different, but I think everybody is from the same basic genome. Mm-hmm. But I suspect, like you're saying, there are different groups. You know, the Bushmen talk about their god is looking like a praying mantis. It's a very benevolent god. You know, it looks a little scary. But if you've ever looked at a, a Bushman person, they have beautiful faces. They have very pointed chins. They have triangular faces, essentially. Interesting. And I wonder if we all, hmm. all of these little groups that, that tweaked at some point or another, you know, that we kind of gained a little bit, you know, maybe it was a side thing that they weren't even trying to do. And yet we're all humans, you know, we can all breed together. That's right. So um, I just think it's fascinating that this whole, sub- I, we could do a whole show on Samaria and NK and, and Leo oh, and yes. all those guys. We could do just a whole show on that. Well, I can't believe, you know, two hours is almost over. And I just wanted to thank you so much for coming on, uh, Valenia, and short notice. And I had such a wonderful time talking to you that I really, really would love to have you on again sometime. And we'll definitely oh, love it. talk about Samaria and some yes. of the really good stuff. Uh, oh. I love history. I love the real history. Mm-hmm. So, and yeah, it has been great. Interesting too, the yeah. original ones. Yeah, thank you guys so much for, for giving me a little time to talk about and for, for discussing this. That was really interesting talking about your ideas on Ascension too, Julia. We can ah, make it happen with our thoughts, our meditations, and our actions. Mm-hmm. It's definitely yeah, there. Yeah, and I think we're moving that way. We are. Absolutely. The kids are made that way. If we just leave them alone, I think <laughs> they're finally they're going to make it We don't give them any there. medication Don't get in their ADD. way. Oh, really? <laughs> don't fix them, please. <laughs> I'm very nervous about that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, they're already just right the way they are. We don't need to take them backwards, you know. They're accelerating fast. That's exactly what we need right now. But it's going to be hard on the old people. Oh, I'm ready for you know, it. You know, people though. want I'm... their Yeah. I We're am. ready for oh, it, but yeah. not everybody is awake and aware. So Michael, it's who fine. do we have? Do we have anybody yet for next well, week? Well, we, uh, you know, I have really been so swamped that I haven't been able to get anybody, but I'm going to try to get someone this week. I, I don't have that much more to do with the uh, chapter. It, it, it's just that February 1st was the deadline, and I'm still chugging along. So, you know, uh, I will see. If not, uh, we will uh, have a show anyway. We'll that's, discuss. Yeah, that's we'll discuss what it's all, all about. The, all these things that are going on, all the latest stuff. Yeah, that's so, absolutely right. Well, Valeni, I, I also want to uh, extend my uh, thanks and appreciation for you coming on the show. You, you, your experiences are fascinating. Well, thank you so much. I really enjoyed sharing them. I appreciate you letting me on to do that. That's what we're here for. That's what we're here for. Indeed. Thank you so much, and we'll definitely have you on again. All right. I enjoyed myself a lot. It was. It was you a lot did of wonderful. You were absolutely wonderful. I could listen to you all night. <laughs> Beautiful, wonderful yeah. stuff. Just sitting around the table talking about interesting stuff. <laughs> <laughs> That's what it's like here. That's right. In our yes. virtual studio. <laughs> Exactly. I got pictures of you both actually right across from me off your Facebook oh. page. Oh. It just makes it easy. I just look right at you and say, I'm just sitting at the table with these folks. <laughs> well, like I All say, right. I'm not a real phone person, so this works great for me. But I really love thinking about the folks enjoying it out there, too. Like oh, I yes. said, there are people. There are a lot of people. <laughs> 
So, okay. Well, Mike, do you want to take us out? or? Uh, sure. Let's say we uh, wrap it up, say good night. And uh, uh, Valenia, once again, thank you for coming on. Bill, thank you for everything you do. Julia, you ran a good show this week. Uh, everybody out there, God bless. Take care. We'll see you again next Saturday at 10 o'clock.